So we're going to go ahead and get started. Today's webinar is entitled Extractions Made Easy. And that's where we're at. Imagine for a second that it's, it's 2020 and instead of having the year of clarity, we're in the midst of this pandemic and all of our offices are in turmoil with regards to mandates from the state dental boards and from the national uh, governments, the federal government, uh, telling us that all we can do is limited services in terms of emergencies. Well, in some cases, that would mean extractions and root canals, and those are kinds of things that a lot of times as general practitioners, we don't do very often. So we thought that it would be a very, very good idea to put together today a very short one-hour presentation that, can, that consolidates an entire course of uh, material, an entire day, into one hour. So we're going to speak really quickly, and the reason we're going to do that is because uh, this is going to be recorded and it's going to be available for you. So when this is all over, you're going to be able to uh, watch it again. So I'm not going to backtrack too much. I'm going to go pretty quick. We're going to cover, uh, in order to keep this entertaining, we're going to cover some stuff using some videos and some live demonstrations of tools. So that'll be very helpful for you guys to visualize what we're talking about. A lot of the parts that are going to be mentioned here are going to be available to you through Hugh Freedy's uh, website. They're going to have a, an entire PDF available to you, and we'll send a link to you uh, at the end so you can easily access that. So don't worry about trying to write down all the numbers. You can write down uh, notes and cliff notes and such just at the high level. I also asked Peggy, who's my local Hugh Freedy representative, if I could use her as a, a, a live person. Sometimes when you first uh, want to start working with a company, all you want to do is talk to a real person. So Peggy has, a, uh, has graciously volunteered to do that for us, and we, I thank her for doing that. As you can see on the screen here, her email is, is here, and you can come back and watch it again. But you can email her and get in touch with her directly, and she can point you in the right direction. For questions and answers, what we're going to do is we're going to fly through this presentation very efficiently, and at the end, what we'll do is we'll stop and we'll take all those questions and answers. So as they queue up, we'll answer them at the end. So I am the smile engineer. I call myself that because I have a few degrees in engineering and then I have a dental degree. So if you put them together, I'm the smile engineer. And we have uh, worked with these companies. Uh, I don't receive any compensation from them. But we want to thank these companies and organizations for helping to spread the word and let out, let people know that we're doing this presentation for their benefit. So thank you to these companies for working with us. This is a summary slide right here of how complicated extractions can sometimes be. This is a, this is a chart that's simply trying to make it easy for us to determine on the left vertical column how many instruments can be used for different teeth. And it's very complicated. And if you break it down, the same kind of content can be broken down this way. And what you'll notice in this one, that pretty much for every single tooth, there's more than one instrument that can be used for those, for those extractions. And today, what we want to do is we want to simplify this whole process. What we'd like to try to do is break it down into three basic instruments that you can use and to pretty much do every case out there. Uh, this is going to be very helpful for you, for your team, and for your patients. Before we get into uh, the armamentarium and the implementation, we need to touch on the fundamentals. So we're going to start right now with uh, a couple of high-level basic principles that you need to understand that everything else will fall from. Now, the first thing is, is that you want to use a steady force. So there is something that happens when you use a steady force that I want to read to you. So by placing a constant and steady load on a tooth, it allows creep to build, and we'll talk about what creep is in a second. And that releases hyaluronic acid, which results in the breakdown of the periodontal ligaments. So what can happen is, is if you apply a steady load to a tooth for about three to four minutes, the tooth all of a sudden just gives way. And we've all experienced this, certainly in dental school, when we were doing extraction, we had a case that wasn't going well, we went and got an attending or a resident, and it took three or four minutes for them to come in, and when they came in, they put something on it and then took the tooth out right away, and they looked like gods, and we were like, man, they are so, they're so amazing. I, I wish someday I can be that good. And, well, they never really told us about this, at least they didn't in my dental school training, is that if you just wait three or four minutes, the tooth loosens itself after you put initial uh, load on it. So that's the first thing we need to know. So be patient. If you give it time, the tooth will loosen itself. So be patient is the first thing. The second thing is creep. What is creep? 
Creep occurs in a material when an increasing deformation is expressed as a function of time when subjected to a constant load. So this is the creep curve for bone. And what you want to know here is on the vertical axis we have strain, which is how much the bone is changing in size. And on the horizontal axis we just have time. So what you can see from this curve is that when you put a load on the tooth, a, a, a tooth to bone interface, immediately there's a change in, 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 in conformation. It changes shape immediately a little bit. And then if you just hold that force steady, just hold that force steady over the next few seconds to minutes, the, the bone will start to change shape. Okay, And then at the very end, you can see it, it changes shape very, very steeply at the end. So if you can wait those three to four minutes, when you get to the end there, the bone just gives way and the tooth just comes right out. So we're going to actually take these principles and use them and we'll show you today how we're going to use those. So the second thing is bone moves. When we apply this force, the bone is going to move. You need to, you need to make sure that you are thinking about bone not like cement in your mind, cement like it doesn't move, but more like soft dirt that can move with time if given time. And how do we know that? Well, just look at this tooth right here. How did these teeth come out of a hole that was smaller than the diameter of the roots? If you look at the roots, they're curved in, their, in, the, in the diameter. If you drew a circle around the roots, it's, it's bigger than the, than the neck of the tooth. But it came out, and the only way for that to happen without the root tips breaking is for the bone to give. In fact, Dr. Curvy, Curvy Levitt out of Las Vegas posted a video to Instagram. If you follow him on Instagram, uh, back in January of a ridge split. A ridge split is a process where you need to make the ridge wider and you do that by making a split in the ridge and then using some tools to widen the bone. But if you actually watch his video, what you'll see is the bones actually bending. It's moving out of the way. So this happens all the time with extraction, so we're going to use that to our advantage. The next tip that you need to understand is that bone is extremely strong in compression. It is about 30% weaker in tension and about 65% weaker in shear. So if we know this, if we know this, we can use this to our advantage. What does this mean? It means that most likely we don't want to put the tooth to the bone interface in compression. That much, nothing much will happen when that happens. In fact, if you take a regular healthy tooth and you bite down on it, nothing happens. And that's because you're putting the, the tooth to the bone in a compressive mode. How do we extract teeth? We don't push down on the, on the root tips, do we? We don't push down on the tooth to do that. We do something different. We're going to get into that. We're going to take advantage of the shear being the weakest mode, and we're going to do that by using torsion. So create shear loads is what we want to do, and we're going to do that through uh, a rotation motion. So about 2,000 years ago, Archimedes said, give me a lever, a fulcrum, and a place to stand, and I can move the world. So we're going to use leverage today, and we're going to use that leverage for one thing, and that's to create space. So if we can use leverage to create space, the teeth are going to come out. Now I really like this particular slide right here because I want you to look at these teeth. We've all looked at these slides before. We all know what teeth look like, but there's a commonality that you see here that, that is just staring right at you, and that is almost every one of these teeth has a conical root. Yeah, some of them are oval, some of them are triangular. Overall, look at this picture. Almost every one of them is a conical root. And of the teeth that aren't conical, they're typically composed of two or three roots that have separated become conical roots. Each and every one of us has probably had the opportunity to try to pull a weed when we're out in the grass, okay, in, in the lawn, there's a weed. How do you pull a weed? Do you grab the green stuff on top and kind of just pull at it? No. What you do is you get down as deep as you can with your fingers, right around the neck of the, of, of the weed, very, very close. Because if you don't get the whole weed out, you'll leave the roots, and then next week you'll have to pull those weeds again, right? So we want to get down really good and tight around the neck of the, of the weed. We're going to do the exact same thing when we do extractions, the exact same thing. And we're going to put these teeth in torsion. Torsion, what we're going to do is we're going to rotate them. We're going to try to take these teeth out the same way you would take a carrot out of the ground. You wouldn't take a carrot and then push it in and out and in and out. What you do is you grab that carrot really close to the, to the ground where it's really close to the neck and then you would rotate it a couple times and pluck it right out. So we're going to do that today and we're going to show you how we're going to do that. 
we're going to start with a, a high level extraction guidelines. And as I mentioned earlier, typically this course is taught and it takes about eight hours. We're going to do it all in one hour because you guys are quick learners, you're going to love it, and you can always hit replay later. So the first thing you need to do is you need to manage the patient. And I'm going to be talking about how I manage the patient uh, throughout the entire process. So for instance, after we get the patient numb, we're going to tell the patient that there's only one rule in our office, and that is there's no pain. That's the rule. There's no pain. There is pressure, and then I reach up gently and I push him on his shoulder and I say, Mr. Smith, you are not going to have any pain today but you are going to feel pressure. And I push lightly on the shoulder and I said, if you have pain, I want you to raise your left hand because I'm a right-handed dentist. I don't want them to hit me. I want you to raise your left hand and I, and I will stop and we'll ask you what's going on and we'll take care of it, but this is going to be a pain-free process. Secondly, you need to guarantee that it is. How are you going to do that? You're going to get them numb. You're going to get them really numb, okay? So if you're, if you're not really good at getting people numb, you need, you need to get better at that because it's very important to get them numb for this. Uh, you are going to have pressure, you are going to hear noises, but you're not going to have any pain. So that's how we start every one of these procedures. That's how we manage the patient. The second thing is calm is contagious. You must set an example for you, your team, and the patient. If you are losing your cool during an extraction, the patient will not have a good experience. That will not be good for your practice. It won't be good for the patient, it won't be good for your practice. They're not going to leave there being raving fans. You want them to have a good experience and, excuse me, it doesn't matter so much if you get the 2003 minutes or 9 minutes as long as the patient had a good experience during that time frame, 3 and 9. You have to keep calm. You're the leader, stay calm. Calm is contagious. The second thing is know your anatomy. So if you have access to a comb beam CT scan, that's great because then you can actually look at the tooth in three dimensions. That's very important. We're always going to use a throat screen. Now, we don't talk in, in absolutes very often, but we always use a, a throat screen when we're doing extractions because a lot of times these teeth we're working on are broken down and they have restorations. A lot of times those restorations are going to separate early in the process. And the throat screen is typically a four by four throat, uh, gauze that you place on the tongue. If the patient has a lot of gag, gag reflexes, try to wet the gauze with a little bit of water first. Sometimes that helps. We're also going to always keep a hemostat right on the bib, right on the bib. If, if this is a problem for certain people, just keep it right uh, close to the uh, tray over the patient or just behind them on a Mayo stand or whatever you're doing. But you always want to have that hemostat available and a split second's notice. If you drop something on the, bib, on the, on the throat screen, you've got just a couple seconds. You can't say, Mr. Smith, don't. He goes, what? And when he does what, he swallows that amalgam restoration that just fell out, okay? You can't say anything. If something falls onto that net in the back of the mouth, you want to be able to know exactly where that hemostat is, grab it, go in and pluck it out. So have a hemostat dedicated for grabbing loose objects. Um, always create movement before increasing pressure. Now this one I'm going to say multiple times throughout the day because this is really, really going to save you a lot of hassle. You want your tooth that you're trying to remove to be moving. You want to see visible movement in multiple directions if possible before it breaks. All right, Not all of them break, but if the tooth isn't moving and then it breaks, you now have roots that are fused to the bone, which means you're typically going to go to a surgical removal technique at that point, which means you have to start cutting things and it slows everything down. It's less of, a, of, an, uh, of an ideal situation for the patient, and it's, it's just not good practice. If you get the entire tooth moving, and then you say, okay, it's moving, and it's moving pretty good, and then something breaks. So it's a two-rooted tooth. The tooth breaks. One of the roots comes out, and the other one doesn't. Guess what? The root tip that's in the hole is already loose. You loosened it when the whole tooth was loose. So retrieving that becomes quite, quite simple. It much, much different, okay? So I can't stress enough how important it is to make sure that you always create movement before you start to increase pressure on the tooth. Want to use bite blocks when removing lower teeth in order to support the jaw. You use a bite block for the upper jaw. A lot of times it gets in the way of the coronary process when the jaw opens, covers the posterior teeth. So a lot of times it doesn't work so good. So bite blocks for lowers, not typically for the, for the uppers. With a 702 burr, which is a surgical burr, most people that when they're starting, when they have to section a tooth, they don't go deep enough. So there's a rule of thumb that go deeper. We'll talk more about that as we get into it. 
Uh, get as apical on the, on the neck of the tooth as possible from the very beginning. This is the same thing with regards to getting uh, the weed out of the ground, the analogy I gave you. You've got to get down on the neck of the tooth in order to get this out effectively, and there's mechanical reasons why. Listen to the tooth. Feel the tooth. Take it the way it wants to go. They're all kind of saying the same thing. As you're doing this, the tooth is going to talk to you. You're going to feel that it wants to go this way easily, and then when you want it to go this way, it doesn't want to go that way. Listen to it. If it wants to go this way towards the lingual, take it to the lingual. If it wants to go to the buckle, go to the buckle. Find the path of least, least resistance and take advantage of that. Be patient. Steady and slow or slow down to go fast. They're all saying the same thing. Slow down to go fast. If you get that tooth movement that we talked about and then the tooth breaks and the root tip is loose, you can still get that out pretty quick. If you go fast at the first, you break it and you've got root tips that are fused to the bone, it's going to slow you down. Why? Because those tips are typically where? Sitting on top of the nerve or sitting underneath the sinus. Both of the areas that are going to give you a pucker factor when you try to go in there with a handpiece. So we don't want that to happen. So slow down, let the hyaluronic acid do its job, and the tooth is going to come out real easy. Uh, be careful between restorations. When you're taking out teeth, and we're going to talk about the protocol that we're going to propose today is going to be a little different than many have probably heard in, in dental school with regards to the use of elevators. I, 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 we'll talk about that shortly, but just be careful between restorations. When you're using elevators, they have a tendency to break the, the adjacent restorations, so be very careful there. Visualize the tooth when possible. That's good common sense. Use leverage. We talked about that to create space. And the very last thing, which is comes from uh, Heartbreak Ridge, Gunny Sergeant. Let's go, move out. You're Marines now. You improvise, you adapt, you overcome. Four minutes, fall out. Ah. So in this movie, Clint Eastwood plays a gunny sergeant that is in charge of taking a group of misfits and turning them to, to Marines. And so he says in this movie, he says it a few times, improvise, adapt, overcome. When you do oral surgery, when you're removing a teeth, you should think the exact same thing. Improvise, adapt, overcome. Why do we say that? First of all, there's nobody standing over your shoulder giving you a grade on this extraction. What, you, what your, objection should, your objective should be is to get the tooth out, saving as much of the surrounding tissues as possible, making the process as atraumatic for the patient as possible in a very timely fashion so that they heal beautifully and they have a great experience, okay? So that's your goal, that's it. Any one of these tools that we're gonna talk about today, if you were to press them into action and ask them to do something that they're not typically asked to do, but with the outcome of what we just talked about, it would be perfectly fine. There's, there's no rule that says you can't use these instruments in a different way. If We're gonna talk about an instrument called the 23 today and we say we use it in a pumping action, but you're gonna see that every once in a while I use it in a rotating action, uh, action. So what we're saying is improvise, adapt, overcome, use these tools to get the job done in a way that's good for the patient and for, and for the, the patient's healing. We're gonna break down the entire surgical kit into three main categories. We have some essentials that we'll, we'll go through real quickly. We're gonna have some elevators, uh, which are basically tools that use leverage to create space. And then we're gonna use, we're gonna have some, some forceps for uh, extracting the teeth. So let's start with the essentials. The first thing we wanna talk about is the mouth prop. I don't typically like the adult mouth props. They're too big. I find that they they don't fit hardly anyone. I don't know what, what adult they made those for. Uh, the two smaller ones typically are great. Everybody's got mouth props. Make sure you use the little loop and tie some floss around that so that if, if the mouth prop becomes loose, they don't aspirate it. Optrogates are great. If you haven't tried these yet, they're great for a multitude of things. But look at this picture and what you're going to note here is how much light is in the mouth. These optrogates are made out of a milky plastic that allows a lot of light to reflect into the mouth and it really illuminates the mouth well, as well as protecting the lips and keeping them out of the surgical site. Here's a quick video on how to insert the optrogate. What we like to do is hold it in the middle like in a figure eight, insert it under the cheek in one buckle side, then under the other buckle side, and then walk it around on the upper and lower lip. And that's it. 
In your kit, you're going to want to have some cur uh, curved Kelly hemostats. We always have two, two of these, all right? Hemostats are, are designed for cutting off small arterioles if you have a bleeder, but they're, they're used in the, in the surgical arena for a multitude of things. Most of the time, people use them as pliers. We do everything from opening packages with these to loosening uh, implant components. Who knows what they're used for? But we have two in our, in our surgical suite, and one is labeled with a, with a little piece of tape that you use for marking your instruments in hygiene. And that one is marked red, and the red is the ruined one. Red for ruined, okay? And that is the one we use for picking up pieces of amalgam and uh, loose particles and gauze or whatever. We use that for that one. The other one is actually designed as a hemostat because nothing is more frustrating than trying to pick up a piece of tissue or clamp down on tissues with hemostats that are bent that don't actually do what they're supposed to do. So you use the bent ones. How do you know if you got a bent one? The first time you use it and it doesn't do what it's supposed to do, you tell your teammate, Put some red tape on this for ruined, and then you know that one's the one you're going to use for ruined and make sure you got some good ones for doing their job. Now, let's go ahead and take the jacket off, roll up the sleeves, and we're going to go to the overhead projector because I want to show you this new, uh, this new black line of instruments that Hugh Freedy's come out with. I'm really keen on that, so let's do that right now. Freedy's new black line and this you know at first glance it looks just like a regular mirror except for it's black now why is this important well here's your traditional mirror and here's the black mirror and what do you see you see that we have all of these highlights that are reflecting now they're reflecting off of my 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 light in this room but what are they reflecting off of when we're doing surgery they're reflecting off of uh, from our headlights and our headlights are creating this reflection it creates eye strain and I'll tell you what, I've been using this for a few months now and I absolutely love it because it reduces eye strain. Not only have they come out with it in the mirror, but they've come out at it with, in a lot of their product line. And so we're systematically replacing all of our instruments with these black lines, so I like them a lot. This is a double-sided mirror. Obviously, this is your traditional single-sided mirror. Whatever is your fancy, you know, they're fine. So mirrors are your, are your, first, your first component that we need to look at. The second thing is you need to have a, uh, just an explorer. We don't use these very often in surgery, but just a traditional explorer. Keep it in your kit because as soon as you don't have one, you're surely going to need it. The next thing is just a, a standard aspirating syringe. And this is the type that we use. We like it a lot. And we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about this because you guys are dentists and you do this for a living. This is your Minnesota lip retractor. I use this all the time, uh, all the time. This is a must have. Uh, created at the University of Minnesota. Uh, you can hold it in a variety of different ways in order to hold the lip back out of the way out of the surgical field. You can also get underneath the periosteum and hold back the tissue. For instance, if we go here and you had a flap, you can get underneath it and hold the tissue back like that. Always make sure that the tip of the, of the Minnesota is down on bone, down on bone and pushing the tissue back like that so you're not putting any undue pressure on top of the soft tissue. That's your Minnesota, you gotta have one of those. The next thing is the Molt 9. Here is the Molt 9. A couple years back there was a show called Man vs. Wild with Bear Girls. And my friends uh, who would watch me do surgery would say, you could be on that show if you had this one instrument. And I believe they're right. This one instrument right here can do so much for you. It's a periosteal, uh, periosteal elevator, so it's designed for elevating soft tissue. It has a pointy end and it has a beaver tail end. The beaver tail end can be used as a uh, tissue reflector. So sometimes you'll see these will have scratches on them from where they've been nicked. But they can be used as a tissue reflector and they're blunt, so they're nice if you're elevating around uh, vital structures. The sharp tissue side, the sharp pointed side, is very important for if you need to what we call pop papilla. And you'll see this in some videos that are about to come up, but typically what you would do is you simply come in between the two teeth, you push down with the tip until it sounds to bone, and then you rotate. And what ends up happening is this papilla will just pop right away from that tooth. Now, 
with respect to cases that are in the anterior and aesthetic cases, it's very important to try not to pop papilla. When we don't want to pop papilla in these areas, we want to maintain that blood supply. In those cases, we might just relieve the periodontal, the circumferential fibers by simply sounding like this and walking around the tooth like that, and that is sufficient. What we're doing is we're just creating a little bit of space between the, the, the periodontal complex here and the tooth so that we can get access to the neck of the tooth. That's what we're doing there. So nothing too terribly special about that. You can do the same thing in aesthetic cases. You can do the same thing with a 15 blade, taking the 15 blade and simply going down and going straight down to bone and walking it around like that as well. So Malt 9 is super important. And you know what's more important than the Malt 9? Uh, the Malt 9 in black. That's right. They came out with it in black. and. And I've got one, so I'm really happy about that. So the black line is really, really nice. All right, so here is a quick video on the Malt 9 to do gentle elevation of the tissue. Just sounding down to the bone and working around the tooth. And we're not really elevating the tissue, we're just we're separating the gingival complex around the neck of the tooth so that we can slide down deeper and get down to the the bone. All right, the next thing I want to talk about is the scalpel handle. Now there's two kinds of scalpel handles as you can see in my slide there. Uh, one is round and the one is the the number five Barb Parker uh, handle that we typically all saw in dental school. Which one of these looks like a pencil? That's right, the round one looks like a pencil. So here's the round one. I like this a lot. The, I've ended up replacing all of my blade handles with this. It has the same tip. This part here is the same as the traditional handle, except instead of being flat, it's round. And what this allows me to do is it allows me to use it just like a pencil. I can rotate it with just finger motion and I can do a drawing, a drawing action like this. Uh, very, very precise. So for periosteal work and such, this is my go-to uh, surgical handpiece. Oh, here's a tip, patient management tip. When you ask for a 15 blade, do not say blade say 15. Everyone in the room knows there's nothing else in the room called 15. So you say, I need a 15. The team members know and the patients don't. And that's really important. When you say 15 blade, they go blade <laughs> and their blood pressure just goes straight through the roof and you don't, you don't need their blood pressure being any higher than it already is. The 15 blade I mentioned is, is this one right here. This blade is your, is your workhorse. You, you know, there's a, a 10, 11, a 12 blade, a 15 blade. There's a lot of different blades out there, but this is your workhorse. You can pretty much get everything done for simple extractions with your 15 blade. Which takes us to the, the, to the second section. So that first section was just your basic essential tools that most all of you have uh, seen or are using currently. The second section is elevators. And we're going to break the elevators down into three main elevators. Uh, we have this first one here, which is your 301 straight elevator. And what you can see from the 301 straight elevator is that it's straight and that it has this kind of concave aspect to it right here. And the proper use of an elevator is to luxate the tooth or create movement of the tooth. And it's very important to understand how you want to do this. So I'm going to show you on a model here. If I was going to go between these two teeth and I want, to, I want to luxate this tooth, if I go into this spot right here, hey Siri, can you zoom in a little bit? Would you like it louder or softer? That's perfect. So the concave side of the instrument, of the elevator, goes against the tooth that you want to loosen. And when you put it in, you're going to rotate it this way. You're going to rotate so that the top of this instrument is pushing against the tooth you want to loosen. So it goes that way, okay? That way. If you go the other way with it, if you go the other way, the mechanical advantage will be to loosen this tooth here. This tooth will become loose, not this one. And if this tooth doesn't have a tooth behind it like this, this is very, very easy to loosen. There's no, uh, there's no abutment tooth beside it. So you go in here, you rotate towards the tooth you want to loosen. So I'm going to rotate this way, okay? Now, what if I want to go on the front? I turn the concave side around so it's facing the tooth that I want to extract, which is the first premolar here. And then I'm going to put it in here. Now, which way am I going to rotate it? I'm going to rotate it this way. I'm going to rotate it into the tooth I want to, to loosen, okay? That's how you use an elevator. Now, 
You know what they should call this tool? They should call this the crown removal tool. In fact, I think Hugh Freedy should put this out as a crown removal tool. This thing is amazing at removing adjacent restorations. If, you, if you've done some extractions, you know this. You put this in here and you put it in there and you rotate the proper way and there's an amalgam on this, there's an MO on this tooth right here, it pops right out. It pops right out and that will slow you down. So I'm gonna suggest that these are very important instruments to have and I'll show you later why, but I don't elevate teeth anymore like this, okay? When we go to the next instrument, it's another elevator. It's the same as the first one, but it's called the 34 and this one is its bigger brother. So the 34 is slightly bigger than the 301. Let me switch to the to the 34 slide. There's a 34 slide so you can see it. And you can see the 34 is wider than the, the 301. These are your standard two straight elevators. Everybody should have these in your kit and we'll talk about when to use them because we don't want them to to knock off adjacent teeth. So those are our straight elevators. The next elevator I want to show you are the criers. These are the criers and they're also called flags. You can see why. They kind of look like a pennant flag. And they're also called east-wests, uh, north-south. We just call them criers. And the way these work is you say you've got a root. Hey Siri, can you get a little bit closer here? Great, perfect. Say you've got a, bif a bifurcated root like this and you are able to get the distal root out. So this one's missing, but this one's still intact. What you can do is you can put this into the extraction socket in the back and rotate like this. And that little sharp point right there will grab the distal aspect of the root remnant in the mesial hole and flick it straight out of the hole. It comes out so easy. So you put it in there like that and then you just rotate and it just flicks it right out. Sometimes, sometimes you have to sacrifice a little bit of this bone. Hey Siri, can you get a little bit closer there? Perfect. So right here, this, this uh, ridiculous bone right here. Sometimes this piece that's in the mesial Remember, for our, for our conversation here, there's a root tip in the mesial, but in the distal there's not one. Sometimes you can't get a purchase point on it because it's broken off below this bone. You can come in here and just get that bone right there and just, just like that. You see how I took that little bit of plastic away? You just go right in there and just take a little bit of that bone, just like that, and then you can get down on the tooth and then flick that tooth right out. Now, why do we have two of these? We have one here. Why do we have this one? So this was the one I've been showing you, and we have this one. Well, it's to go the other way. So for the, for the purposes of the conversation, if we had a root tip rem remnant in the posterior hole here, and we wanted to get it from, and the, and the mesial root tip was removed, we can put this here, and we can flick this way. We can rotate it into the tooth and simply remove that root remnant that way. Okay, so these are your, your criers, uh, East-Wests and Flags. They're all the same. They just have one set of these. We don't use them very often, but when we do use them, they're very helpful. Which brings us to forceps, which is pretty much everyone's favorite part to talk about. Now here's where the engineering becomes fun. I'm going to show you, did I go too fast? Yeah. So here I want to show you on this slide um, is that big? Is the Siri is that big? Okay, good. I want you to look at this slide for a second. I'm going to talk about this slide for a second because it's going to be paramount to creating those shear loads or the torsional loads that we talked about. We have on the screen here two two forceps: the ash forcep uh, that kind of looks like a bird beak, and then the straight. And the straight's on the right, and the ash is on the left. And what I want you to do is notice that I've orientated these two green lines so that the two dotted green lines are parallel, the one on the ash forcep and the one on the straight. And those are representing the long axis of the tooth, the long axis of the tooth. So the beaks that you see on the ash forceps and the straights would engage the teeth exactly the same way in this image. And what, what you're going to see is that I've added to the image a blue line that represents the moment arm. So on the left, underneath the ash forcep, there's a blue dotted line that starts at the green, it's perpendicular to the green line, and it runs all the way out to the red X. 
on the straight elevators, there's a green line, there's a blue line at the bottom that runs perpendicular to the green line and it goes out to the X. Now the question I ask is which blue line is longer? That's right, the moment arm on the ash forcep is many, many times larger than the moment arm on the straight. Well, what does that mean? It means there's a huge mechanical advantage to the ash forceps over the straight forceps. In fact, if I don't even need straight forceps in my armamentarium. I would never need them. Now, you're gonna see plenty of videos with me using them today because they make for better video, but they don't make for better uh, surgical outcomes. The, the ash forcep works a whole lot better because of this mechanical advantage. And let me, let me go to the, uh, the model here and I'll show you how it works. All right, so here we have an ash forcep. And it looks like, we call these sometimes the bird beaks, right? Because it looks, if you look at it, it looks like, kind of like a parrot, right? The bird beaks. Um, the way you're going to use this instrument, and it's typically designed for lower anteriors, that's what it's typically designed for, but I'm going to use it for every single tooth that has a conical shape, which is pretty much every single tooth. We talked about that, right? And the way you're going to use it is you're going to grab this instrument, you're going to come into the arch, you're going to get a hold of your tooth after you've elevated the soft tissue and you want to make sure that the beaks are down as low as possible, as close to the bone as possible, maybe even touching the bone or grabbing onto the bone if necessary. And then you apply a little bit of force and then you're going to, I'm going to change my direction, you're going to rotate this way. Do you see? This is my mechanical advantage. I have this huge lever arm that's allowing me to rotate that tooth. So what does that mean? That means with very little force of my hand, because there's a magnification by having this long moment arm here, this long moment arm, that magnification allows me to have more control. I don't have to pull, I don't have to push too hard on this tooth because I have so much power. I can push very, very lightly in a rotating action like this. I'm exaggerating, but I'm showing you here. Just like that, that rotation right there I can do that with a very light amount of force. Well, because I'm using light force, I'm not inadvertently doing what? I'm not crushing down on these handles. If I was to crush these handles together, if I was to push these handles together really, really hard, this hinge is converting this leverage into this force, and these beaks will crush your tooth. Well, that's no good. We don't want to crush the tooth. We want to hold the tooth. So the only force that we need on the handles is just enough force to allow the beaks to remain in contact with the tooth or the tooth remnant. We don't need any more force between here, squeezing this way. The second force we're gonna have is we're going to have the rotational force. So now I have the rotational force this way that takes the tooth out and this force squeezing the handles together which keeps me on to keeps me on the tooth that I'm interested in removing. Now compare that to the straights. These are your straights, okay? The straights allow me to get on the tooth the exact same way. Now typically the straights are designed for maxillary anterior teeth. They get on the tooth the same way, but now I have only this force to rotate it. I'm rotating it this way along the long axis, and that same axis is the same for, is the same axis that I'm using to squeeze my hands together. So what can happen is, as you're squeezing this, you can inadvertently squeeze this too hard because you're trying to squeeze this and rotate at the same time. So, take home point. These are awesome. I use them on almost every single tooth. Uh, don't use them on multi-rooted teeth unless we section the multi-rooted teeth and sometimes we use it on those. But for any single tooth, from premolar to premolar, uppers and lowers, this is my workhorse, and I'll show you some videos in a second. This works just fine, but it doesn't have the mechanical advantage that this does, and you're likely to have more complexities with this, and you can't use this on the lowers uh, very effectively because it's straight and it will run into the uh, maxillary teeth. So this is my bread and butter. Quick note, when you order these, some parrots have, have fat jaws and some parrots have narrow jaws. So if you're doing a premolar where the crown is kind of bulbous, 
this works really well. If you're doing a lower anterior where the crown is kind of narrow, this works really well. So I have just two in my armamentarium. Okay, just two of those. All right, those are your ash forceps. And here is a video that will narrate for you. So we're using some straights here and notice how we're removing the tooth now. We're rotating the tooth. This is all in real time, no magic. Rotate left, rotate right, and the root comes right out. Same thing, every single time. Left, right, root comes right out. What we're doing here is we're taking advantage, did I? Okay. What we're doing here is we're taking advantage of the mechanical uh, force called shear. We're creating a shear force between the tooth and the bone interface. And we know, remember from the first slide, that it's not very strong that way. And what ends up happening is the tooth comes straight out. It also, because we're not elevating, we're not luxating the tooth to the buckle, it also protects that very thin buckle bone. So in the anterior zones where we're trying to maintain that bone for aesthetic reasons, you don't want to luxate and then break that buckle bone off with your tooth. If you rotate it, it puts the buckle bone in compression along its long axis, its moment of inertia axis, which is a complicated way of saying it's keeping it safe, okay? So when you rotate anterior teeth, it keeps that buckle bone safe. Only, uh, only thing you have to be concerned about is with ankylosed teeth, but you'd be concerned about the bone being ankylosed to the tooth regardless uh, of that condition. Okay, here is the same kind of scenario. I'm gonna show you the next video. And this one is with the, can you make, hey Siri, can you make the video large? Thank you. So this is using what I use all day long. Now, now notice, when I come in with the ash forcep, you see how you can't see the tooth? So I don't use this in my video work much because you guys can't see the teeth. But notice that the action is the exact same action as the straight forceps that we used just a minute ago. We're grabbing the tooth, and we're rotating it. Grab, rotate. Notice we get really close to the neck of the tooth, as close to the bone as possible because it creates a mechanical advantage and we rotate these teeth out. This is for an in-sequence fully guided case. We're getting started here by removing the teeth. You can imagine it's very important if you're doing a fully, mount, a fully guided uh, implant case like this. You don't want to waste time on teeth. You want to get them out of the way so you can get on with doing, doing what you need to do but you need to be efficient at it so that you don't have any issues with the bone. Do you go straight from your periosteal 15 straights to forceps for interiors? Okay, so the question is, do I go, uh, go from my, do, you, do I go straight to your 15 periosteal? To forceps. For to forceps. Interiors. So, okay, so w what I want to tell you guys is that we mentioned earlier in terms of strategy, I don't use these anymore. I, I don't use these as a starting point. So in dental school, I was told, put an elevator on every tooth first, and then go to your forceps. Well, I'll tell you, the way I want to get almost every one of these teeth from premolar to premolar out is by rotating it. Well, this doesn't create a rotational force. It creates a tipping force. So it doesn't create the right kind of force. And I already told you that if we're between two teeth and we're concerned about the adjacent tooth, which we always are, that this typically has a tendency, if you're not very careful, of loosening restorations, crowns, veneers, uh, amalgams, composites, everything. It can be loosened by this tool. So what I do is I just skip it. Here's my protocol. Come in, elevate around the tooth with my malt nine, get on it with my ash forceps, grab it, and rotate. Okay, that's it. That's how we do it. And I've got some videos here in just a second, some, some real live videos that'll walk you through that. All right. This is a typical ash forcep extraction. So the, the last one was a serial extraction on a full mouth case. This one is a premolar that's broken off of the gum line. And we're going to get on it with the ash forceps here. Where I'm applying, you can see my, my index finger is applying a little apical pressure. Now notice the reflections in the metal. Do you see the reflections? How they're, I'm rotating the instrument back and forth and back and forth. And I'm holding the instrument with just enough force. The beaks are only compressing just enough to hold the root remnant. I'm not trying to crush it. The, usually that part is very fragile anyways. 
uh, because it's normally demineralized. So we want to just hold it just enough and then it just comes out. And that's a typical broken root uh, premolar extraction. Rotate, 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 no elevation. No, no, no luxation with, a, with an elevator. And go ahead and curatage and irrigate and you're done with that case. So that's a, that's a typical example of uh, straight teeth. So now we're gonna be able to do that, that protocol right there from premolar to premolar, straight through the front anterior teeth, all of them the exact same way. Get out of it with the ash and rotate, okay? But when we get to the first molars, they change a little bit, right? And the first instrument I wanna talk about is the, called the cow horns. So you can see in the video, in the picture here, that, and, and this is the cow horns, they're called 23s, and they're called cow horns because they look like cow horns, okay? So pretty clever, right? They look like cow horns. Now the way I remember this is, <clears throat> I'm a big Michael Jordan fan. Michael Jordan's number was 23, he played for the Bulls. He played for cow, cow horns, 23s, right? So this particular instrument is the 23. So the 23 cow horns. All right. The way this instrument works is it works through a pumping action and it's great for bifurcated teeth. So let me show you what I mean. We're going to come in here and we're going to look at this, this uh, second molar here. And this second molar, we're going to elevate the soft tissue. All right. So we're going to come in with a molt nine. We're going to elevate the soft tissue on both sides, pushing down to the bone. And once it's loose enough, hey Siri, can you zoom in just a little bit? We're going to take the 23s and we're gonna put them into the furcation, okay? We're gonna put them into the furcation just like that. And that's what you're gonna see in the mouth, okay? And then what you're gonna do is you're gonna do this pumping action, up and down, up and down. And let me do this. I'm gonna magically remove the soft tissue. I'm gonna show you the furcation and I'm gonna come in here. I'm gonna put that right under the buckle and then I'm gonna make sure that I get into the lingual here, into the lingual furcation. And then once I get it into position here, I'm going to apply a little bit of light force until it starts to seat. So a little bit like this, and then it seats. And then I'm going to start to apply. Hey, Siri, can you zoom out a little bit? Sorry, I'm not making up my mind here. A little bit more. I want to show this. When I'm squeezing this together, I'm going to keep kind of a constant force here with slightly increasing pressure as I'm bringing these together. These two horns are sliding into the furcation. And as they do, they're creating a mechanical leverage on the buccal bone and on the lingual bone, and they're literally pulling this tooth straight out of the socket, all right? So pressure, 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 pressure's increasing, and then that tooth is gonna come straight out. Now, with, with roots that are parallel or convergent, when doing this technique, it's possible for this tooth to shoot out of the mouth like popcorn. So it's very important. What did we say earlier? Always use a throat screen. For this particular instrument, in this, especially this instrument, when you're doing this, this can shoot out, and when it shoots out, it hits the upper teeth somewhere or the, or the palate, and it shoots around like a ping, uh, 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 pinball machine. So that's the word I'm looking for, a pinball machine. The, the, it shoots all over the mouth, and you don't know where it's going to go. So that's how you use a 23. Let me show you how, you, how it looks on a video. All right. So difficult to see here, but I'm coming in with the 23s. I'm manipulating it until I feel like I've got a good point. Now notice my hand in the upper left corner of the screen is going up and down, up and down. And, what it's, and I'm squeezing as I'm doing this, the cow horns are squeezing squeezing together underneath the furcation of the tooth. And now I'm giving a little buckle pressure and then I'm going back, resetting, letting the, kit, the tip slide in a little bit more, a little bit of rotation force, just a little bit to let that, those tips kind of fit in there. And now look, it just kind of rolls out. And that's how you do it. And notice the tips are between the mesial and distal root tips. That's where you want them to go. If you can't see, I mean, a lot of times with these extractions on people that have periodontal disease, th that furcal involvement is, is already started for you. So that makes it real easy. If you're working on a younger patient who has good bone there, sometimes you're going to have to make a little sp a spot there with a burr in order to get down there with that. But this particular instrument works great for 
uh, two rooted teeth in the lower lower areas, so first and second molars. And not very often do we use it on thirds, but uh, first and second lower molars, it works really well. That's your 23 cow horns. All right, so go ahead and, hey Siri, can you make my screen big? Good. Second World War, Germany created a artillery gun called the 88. It was an 88 millimeter cannon. It was used for anti-tank and for uh, anti-aircraft. It was used for a multitude of things. The biggest tooth in the mouth is, is the first molar. So we need the big guns, right? We got to bring out the big guns. We call them the 88s. They come in a pair. They come in a left and a right. And this is what they look like. They actually have, if you look, these are the two pair. And you can see they're symmetrical, but mirror, mirror images of each other. So I'll just use this one here, which is the left, to show you how this works. OK, so these two prongs go on the palatal side. The one prong goes on the buccal side. And what that allows palatal root and it go in between the mesial buccal and the distal buccal roots of the, of the first molar. And it's got this offset here. And what this offset allows you to do is get back into the mouth past the lip so you can get parallel to the tooth and get, and get a hold of it. So for instance, let me see if I've got a model here. Let's say, for instance, we were going, and that was a tooth and not an implant. So what we would do is we'd place that right there, right at the level of the bone. Okay, you cut off. Okay, so I was just told by Siri that my audio cut off for a split second there. So uh, I'm going to back up for just a second. And in the Second World War, Germany had created a, a weapon called the 88s. They were 88 millimeter cannons. Uh, and they were very effective. And they're called the big guns, right? So for the biggest teeth in the mouth, the, the first molars, right, on the upper first molars, the largest teeth in the mouth, we need to bring out the big guns. So the way, this is a, a way to remember, just like Michael Jordan is the cow horns, 23s are the cow horns, the 88s are your big guns for your first molars. And this is the 88 forcep, and it's designed for extracting upper uh, molar teeth. You can use them for second molars too, but predominantly for upper first molars. All right, it has three prongs, and those three prongs, what they do is they seat around the teeth into the furcation space on the buckle, right there, and then on the palatal side, what ends up happening is that these two prongs here on the palatal side will actually grab that palatal root, okay? So let me show you. I have a, a case from Friday, an emergency case that we did. And I want to show you. exactly what this looks like. Okay, Siri, can you zoom in just a little bit? So this is uh, tooth number 14. So the single, the single beak goes into the frication between the mesial and distal buccal roots. And then when we turn it over, on the palatal side, the two prongs are always on the palate. The two prongs are always on the palate. And this is going to straddle either side of your palatal root, which allows you to extract the tooth. And we're going to use this predominantly with a buccal leverage motion. We're pretty, pretty much most of these come out to the buccal. So let's go to the videotape and show you how this works. All right, so we're doing a full mouth extraction case here, serial extraction for an in sequence fully guided case. And we're getting on this tooth. It's got a gold coping. And the gold coping is separating. OK, hold on just a second, guys. Our computer just told us that it wants to shut down for a system upgrade. Are we still running? Give us just a second, guys. We, the computer is trying to kick us out. Is it still working? It's still working. We're just trying to keep it from uh, 
from kicking us out. All right, so here we go. We're going to go through how it, 88 is typically used. Again, let me back up and walk you through this. So uh, for those of you that have logged in, let's just recap real quickly. For all single rooted teeth, which is pretty much premolar to premolar, we're going to take those out with our ash forceps. And we're going to take that out in predominantly a rotating motion. All right. When we go to the first molars, for the lowers, we're going to use the Michael Jordan cow horns, the 23s. Okay. We're going to use those in a pumping action. And we had just gotten to the 88s, the big guns, the German big guns from the Second World War for the upper maxillary posterior teeth. And those are going to be extracted with more of a, of a rocking motion towards the buckle. And we'll pick up in just a second here. Okay, are we good? All right, so I'm going to go back to the video that we were going to show and walk you through that right now. All right, so on the upper left here, tooth number 14 is going to be extracted. And the way we're going to do this is we're going to put pressure and see how we're just holding the bone, we're holding the tooth to the buckle. There's firm pressure here, we're holding it, holding it, holding it. We're letting that hyaluronic acid do its job. We're letting hydraulic pressure build up from bleeding. You can actually see it weeping around the neck of the tooth. She just, my assistant just suctioned it away. And there it just gave. So the tooth is loose now. I slip off it inadvertently. I regain my, my purchase point and we extract the tooth. Overall, first molar air extraction, what, what was that, 30 seconds or so. Uh, the one thing you need to be concerned about when extracting teeth uh, using the 88s is the potential for removal of radicular bone. So sometimes it will take out buccal bone. So if you're doing a case where you're planning on doing an implant and you do not want to lose that buccal bone, that all important buccal bone, then you may want to opt for sectioning that tooth rather than going straight to the 88s. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second. Most everybody inside their kits will have one of these. This is called the 150 uh, upper. It's a universal uh, forcep, as well as uh, the 151s, which are that look like this, which are the universal lowers. So let's go to the monitor here and I'll show you how to tell the difference when you're looking at into your into your surgical kit. All right. So what okay Siri, can you back out a little bit with the view here? Okay, perfect. All right. So you look at these two and you're like, gosh, they, they look kind of the same. They're very similar and it's very confusing, right? Well let me give you a little tip here. What you want to do is you want to hold both of these like this, such that the handles here are curved like this, like they're shedding water, okay? Like if water was coming this way, they're shedding water. And now, all of a sudden, it becomes very clear which one's for the upper, and this one's for the upper, and this one's for the lower. So if you hold it in your hand like this, like this, with an overhand grip, that's for the upper. If I hold it an overhand grip here, that's for the lower. So once again from the side, so that you can see that clearly, if they're both con uh, both holding held with uh, a convex curvature here, this is pointing to the upper tooth, this is pointing to the lower teeth. That's how you know the difference. These are called universals. I use them for picking up uh, loose parts. I don't really use them uh, rarely do I use these to take a tooth out. I just use them if I've sectioned a tooth. For instance, on the upper, I've sectioned a tooth and I need to get one tooth uh, piece left. I can get on that one tooth piece, maybe the mesobuccal root, and then uh, create a rotational force like this with it and extract that, extract that root remnant. So those are your universal uh, forceps. So that's it. So in a nutshell, you've got your, your ash forceps, right? You've got your 23s, and you've got your 88s. So premolar to premolar, lower bifurcated teeth, and upper trifurcated teeth. This has three for three, two for two, 
and then your count, your uh, your ash forceps for everything else. So those are your three forceps. Do you elevate first at all, or just go straight to the eighty-eight? So the question I just received was, do I elevate at all? And and I I almost never elevate anymore at all. <clears throat> the only time I may elevate is when I'm doing a full mouth uh, extraction for uh, immediate, like all on four kind of solution. In those cases, if the patient is relatively young, does not have terribly bad periodontal disease, it, it, there may be the opportunity to go in there and just luxate uh, with the elevator, start with a 301, then go to the 34 uh, if necessary, just to put a little bit of, uh, of a trauma on the root. So I would do that in the posterior on the both sides, left and right. And by the time I come back around, it's been a couple of minutes, that hyaluronic acid has had a, had a chance to do its job. The periodontal ligaments have become weaker. And then I get on it right with the 88s. But remember, when, I, when we luxate, we oftentimes damage adjacent teeth inadvertently. I, I can't say how many times I've inadvertently luxated a crown off of an adjacent tooth. And we tell the patient, as long as the margin's not damaged, We'll bond it back. On, we'll bond it back on, but it's an inconvenience. It's an inconvenience for us, the team. They have to go get the cement. We have to control hemorrhaging. We want to make sure we get a good dry field. It's just not convenient. So almost always, I go straight to the forceps in almost all cases now. Almost all cases. I will show you here when we get to the section on the surgical extractions when we're going to use the the um, straight elevators on the surgical part right here. Okay. So here is an example of tying it all together. So here we go. So this is a serial extraction. We're gonna take out all the teeth and we're gonna start by popping papilla. We push down, sound down in between the teeth and rotate with the Malt 9. Now here, look, I'm using the 301 elevator and this is a prime example of when we would use it. We're just creating a little bit of motion, just a little bit. We're just loosening the teeth a little bit and I will do this on the left side. I'll go to the right side and I'll come back to take out the teeth on the upper right. So we're going in to the second molar and we're going to get on it with the 88s. We're going to hold constant pressure to the buckle. See how it's already moving? Constant pressure. Now I let it loose, reposition the grips a little bit more apical and the tooth comes out. So 10 seconds, trifurcated teeth come out like this all day long. All right. Steady force to the buckle, rotate to the lingual. It dropped. Am I worried? No, because it fell onto the throat screen, right? That's why the throat screen's there. Now we're under premolar, what should we do? We should go to our ash forceps, get a hold of the tooth as close to the ground as possible, as close to the, to the root as possible to the bone, and we create a rotational force with our ash, and we're gonna walk right around the horn with the ash forceps here. Rotate, rotate, rotate. Bifurcated comes out the same way. Now. I'm using the straight forceps here, but with the same motion. I'm creating a rotational force to pluck these teeth out. All right, nice little ridiculous or, uh, apical cyst there. So the only reason I'm doing this is for the presentation purposes so you can see how the rotation forces are working. We're just rotating these anterior teeth and there's no magic here. I'm, not, I'm just rotating it. All of the bones left intact. This is the most atraumatic way that I know to remove teeth rotate them. Do not try to luxate them. Now, in, if this was a real case where I was doing it for uh, other purposes than the presentation purposes, I would have used the ash forcep. Now, I'm under the other premolar on the other side. I'm using the ash forcep because you can't get the straights in there anyways. Now, I'm onto the molar on the other side. I go to the 88s. Okay, do you see the little bit of hemorrhaging that just came out on the mesial there? That's creating a little bit of pressure. I know I'm doing my job. I'm holding it. I, I go to the palate just for a second. I come back, come back to the buckle, reposition, get a better grip, further apical. And now it's loose, so I just wiggle it very lightly because it's already completely loose. And that's in real time, no edits. And that's your 88L for the left. 88L for left. And notice there, do you see the buckle bone there that's, that's intact? Now, why did I skip the canine here? I'll tell you why I skipped the canine. Canines have long roots. And when I got on it the first time, it didn't budge. So I just skipped it. I knew that I had already created a little bit of weeping, a little bit of trauma to the tooth, and now it just comes out in 10 seconds. 
So if you're stuck with a case where you have a tooth that's being very resistant, put a little trauma to it, create a little rotational force on it, leave it alone. Come back in a few minutes and, and get after it and it should come out just fine. Now I'm using my curette, making sure that I don't have any, any sort of infection left in the bottom of these holes. And you can see there's very little trauma done to this case. Now, all the tissues are intact. Uh, we were able to extract all these teeth without it having to raise a flap or anything. So this is what you'd like to do. Now, curettage and irrigation on every single case. The same case, we're gonna to go to the bottom here. We're gonna use the Molt 9, pushing down in between the, the papilla, interdental papilla, and rotating. And we're gonna get on the first one with our ash forcep. Now you're gonna see how, when I'm using these ash forceps on the lower here, how hard it is for me to stay out of the view of the camera. And there's your canine. And then the centrals and the laterals are, are relatively simple. They come out pretty quickly. But you see how the hand is in the way? So you can't use this, you know, the straight forceps on the bottom. So I use the ash forceps on the bottom, but I use them on the top too. They just obstruct the view. But that's my go-to instrument for all single-rooted teeth, and I consider premolar single-rooted teeth, as that one just came out the same way. Curatage, and we're going to talk about our serrated curette here in just a second. And we're done, so we can take the throat screen out, take the, the bite block out. Notice that bite block had gauze on it or uh, floss on it to keep it from being aspirated. Okay, so now I want to talk about a little mis a couple miscellaneous instruments that help us with the site management. And the first one is the double ended root tip pick. And we'll go to the, the camera here, and you'll see that I have both of these. I love this instrument. Okay, so this is my typical instrument. It's the silver one, but I just recently got the new uh, black coated one, which I like a lot. Um, but, and, and you can see why. You see how much more reflection there is off of this than there is that. So when we use this, the way we wanna use it is we wanna elevate and flick out little remnants of tooth that might be left behind. Now, when does that happen? Well, in our case, if you follow this protocol, you're going to make sure the tooth is loose before you snap the root off. And that, that'll take a little bit of practice. As you'll probably make a few, few mistakes along the way where you snap the tooth off too early and go, okay, I was applying too much force to the top of the tooth before I got it to move. But the protocol is that the tooth is moving. Once the tooth is moving, if it breaks after that, what's down in the hole is loose, and that's where these come in very, very helpful. So what you're gonna to wanna to do with this, okay Siri, can you zoom in a little bit tighter here? Actually, let me use this one here. What you wanna do with this is it's got two ends and they're curved in the opposite directions. So one, is, one side's kind of flat and the other side's concave. So you see that? And so that way, you, by having both ends on the same instrument, you can easily turn it over to get into a position you want to get into. What you want to do is you want to go down uh, in between the bone and the root tip in a, in a position where you can get down in there. Say there's a root tip left in here. And you get down beside it and then you flick it. You flick it. Or this is so sturdy. Sometimes I'll rock it back and forth to get a purchase point. And then once I get a purchase point, I'll actually rotate it this way. I'm exaggerating the, the amount of rotation, but I'm rotating it this way. And this acts like a little elevator. And sometimes that'll get a little piece out. Occasionally, if that piece is not, uh, it's loose, but there's no room for me to get down with this, we'll use our cube, we'll talk about that. It's a piezo, we'll talk about that in a second. Or what I'll do is I'll go in, I'll make a little slot with a, with a hand instrument to create a purchase point so that this root tip pick can go in there and flick it out. But this is the only root tip pick I use and that's because it's double-ended, so it works in every, every uh, location that I go into. Hey Siri, can I get the power cord to my computer? Guys, we're 
one second away from starting back up here. Um, well, as you would have it, our other computer that's programmed by our IT guy decided it wanted to quit. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, you know, it's funny that I started the video off with improvise, adapt, overcome. Uh, if that really wasn't my mantra, and if I really didn't live that, didn't take that to heart, uh, I would be uh, feeling even worse than I feel already. So uh, give me one second here. I'm going to launch the program one more time. <laughs> unbelievable. Just unbelievable. All right. And then let me jump to our slide. And we're almost to the end here where we can, where we can um, do our questions and answers. for it. Do you want to answer some questions? Sure. Um, is there a mechanical advantage of using the ash instead of rongeur forceps? Okay, so the question that was asked, is there a mechanical advantage to using the ash over rongeurs? And the answer is yes, there is. And the first, but there's, there's more to this question than meets the eye. The first thing is, <clears throat> um, ash forceps are, are designed for removing teeth. Rongeurs are designed for pinching bone. I don't have a rongeur on, on this surgical kit this is predominantly for uh, um, simple extraction. So I, with rongeurs are designed for removing bone, all right? And in dental school, they'll say, hey, because the rongeurs have these sharp edges, go ahead and use the rongeur to grab a root tip or grab a, uh, a, a piece of tooth that's re remaining and you know, grab it and, and pull it out. The problem is, is that these root remnants oftentimes can damage the edge of your rongeurs and put nicks in them. And so then it makes the rongeurs less effective as a rongeur, which is designed for removing bone. So in, in my practice, I personally don't use rongeurs to remove teeth. I use the instruments that we've shown today to remove teeth. The second thing is rongeurs operate, um, the rongeurs that I have are uh, uh, double action rongeurs. So if you're going to buy rongeurs, my recommendation is double action rongeurs so they have a, a force magnifier in there. But nevertheless, rongeurs still operate very similar to a pair of, um, say for instance, a pair of scissors like this, uh, a scissor action. And that scissor action doesn't give you the same mechanical advantage that the ash forcep does. So the ash forcep still allows you to have instead, because when I put this and rotate, I don't get that mechanical leverage that I get with the ash. So mechanical, uh, ash wins for taking out teeth. Ash wins because it's designed for taking out teeth. For removing bone, the rongeurs work. And if you're going to buy a rongeur, you buy the double action rongeur because it works better than the single action rongeur. So that's the rongeur question. OK, we're back up and running. We're going to go. We're at the uh, slide here for the root tip pick. So that was that. Now, here's an image of how it's used. Notice that it's going down on the distal. And if it's rotated on the distal in this image, what's going to happen is the bone that's behind that root tip is going to be placed into compression. Well, bone loves compression, right? So if we place that bone in compression on the distal and we are able to flick that forward, that, that bone that's in the middle, the radicular bone be between the two uh, sockets, is going to be put into to tension, right? So that bone is less strong than the bone that's on the distal, which means that you're more likely going to flick that root tip out if you flick it that way. Another thing you should note is that when the roots are curved, you typically want to imagine an extension of the curvature of that tooth 
and you want to flick it towards that curvature. So for instance, this is a good illustration of the root remnant is being flicked towards the mesial. It's being rotated up towards the mesial, which is a continuation of that distal socket that you see in the, in the illustration there. All right. When we do extractions, we must clean the site when we're done. We do that with a curette. We use a surgical curette, and I have two of them here, and they're difficult to see because these were some early prototypes. This is your curette, double-ended, and it has a larger spoon on it, and what you're going to do is you're going to go into your socket, and you're, gonna, you're going to scrape the walls of the socket. Now, I have these new uh, curettes that just came out, and they have serrations on them. And they're super, super helpful. Let's see if we can get down. Yeah, this one has the serrations on it. So let me see if I can get an angle. There you, there you go. You see that, guys, right there, right on the edge. The new ones that just came out, these were prototypes, but the new ones have even more aggressive serrations. This is really, really important, and let me explain to you why. When we extract a tooth, oftentimes the lamina dura is intact. In fact, the way that I extract the teeth with these ash forceps from rotating, the socket's not traumatized very much at all. The lamina dura is almost 100% intact, and it doesn't bleed. Well, if the socket doesn't bleed, you don't get a blood clot. If you don't get a blood clot, you don't get a fibrin clot. If you don't get a fibrin clot, you don't get good bone growth. If you don't get good bone growth, nobody's happy. The patient's not happy, and you're not happy. So what does that mean? We've got to make the socket bleed. We've done too good of a job of taking the tooth out. We must make it bleed. So a regular curette, just a regular curette, goes into the hole here. And when we go into the hole with a regular curette, oftentimes it's not sharp enough. It's not sharp enough to make it weep, okay? So I want something that's a little bit sharper. So these serrated curettes here are amazing. I love them. But they go in there and they really can scrape that bone. I want to get it to bleed. I want to see it bleeding. If I have really, really dense lamina dura, I'm actually going to go in there with a burr, like a round burr at eight round slow, and roughen up that surface to get it to bleed. Yet you want this to bleed before the patient leaves. Here's an illustration of one of the new um, serrated curettes. And you can see that not only does it have teeth on it, but they kind of did a hybrid and on the flat face of it, they've actually put little serrations very similar to a bone file. So this works really good. Now, the illustration here is showing that if you can scrape that lamina dura and get it to bleed, that's a good thing, okay? That's a real good thing. You want that site to bleed. A lot of times with this protocol, you're not gonna have bleeding there. You need to get, the, you need to get it to bleed. The bone file is a, an instrument that I'm going to go to the next slide first before we go to the, to the, this is the bone file here. And on the next slide, you can see on this illustration, when you take out a tooth around the edge, there can be like a crater. Like if you dropped a, uh, a, a bowling ball into some sand, it would create a lip around the edge of the sand, a crater, just like a, an asteroid would striking the moon. And so those little craters around the edges, the little sharp edges can be irritating to the patient. So a bone file, which is what we have here that I'm illustrating right here, can be used to go in and just draw across that sharp edge. And by doing that, you can uh, take the bone spurs off. This particular one has two sides, two ends. Uh, they both have the same type of hatch um, work on them, except one is large and one small. So depending on the site you're working on, one of these sites will work really well. I, I like this in particular because my old bone files were only draw only, and these new ones that you see here have a crosshatch design to them that allow them to work in a push, a push, and a pull. So they work in both directions, which is nice. I like that because sometimes it, it's just easier to push or pull, depending on the situation that you're working in. So that's your, your uh, your bone uh, file. So the next thing I want to do is I want to talk about surgical extractions. The kind of the definition of a surgical extraction in my mind is we've gotten to a situation where we need to use some other tools to remove the root tip or root remnant and we need to use um, something that cuts typically. So in this particular area if you're going to be cutting a lot of times you're going to be doing a couple of sutures and you're going to be working with soft tissue a little bit more aggressively. There's two types of tissue, uh, tissue pliers the first one here are roughly six inches in length, which is a good length to get to the back of the mouth, but they're smooth. So if you look right here on this section right here, there's no teeth on them. They have a rough cross-hatched area for grabbing the tissue, but they're not, they don't have any teeth. On these, 
these called two, one and twos or two and ones. If I look right down on the top there, do you see that? On the top there, you have a, you're going the wrong way. Siri, you're going the wrong way. Thank you, love. So on this side, you have one tooth, and on this side, you have two teeth, and they interdigitate. This works great for grabbing soft tissue. You can grab soft tissue with this and this won't let go. The problem is it's, it's, it's pinching it with these sharp points. So if you're working in a situation where you don't want to pinch it with the sharp points, you want to use the flat ones over here on this side. And if you're okay with pinching it with these sharp points, then the sharp one works really well. So I have both. This also works really well. This uh, smooth one here works really well when working with your cross-linked collagen membranes for grafting because it doesn't perforate the collagen. So it, it handles the collagen really nicely. So that's another thing to consider. All right, so in dental school, they scared the bejesus out of us with regards to um, air embolisms. And the reason was is that if you had a standard handpiece, like the one on the illustration right here, that that, that air piece, that hand piece is shooting water and air out the tip and that, that air may create an air embolism. So here is one of the best tips probably of the whole presentation and that is um, this product right here. It's made by NSK, and this one on the bottom. Uh, actually shoots water out the tip but the air can be turned off. It's at a 45 degree head instead of a more like a 105 degree head like this one, this is a normal, normal attachment. But they're both E-type attachments, so they both snap down onto your E-type connector, your E-type motors. So this can be taken in any electric motor operatory that you have right away and used immediately. They both go straight down on your E-type connectors, and this can be used for your surgeries. And because of its angulation, it can get into tight spots in the posterior really, really well. So for third molar extractions, even second molar extractions, this gets in there really nice and you don't have the concern over the air embolisms. So with regards to the burrs, you can get the burrs in this 25 millimeter length right here, and those work really well. And we're gonna talk about a little bit more about burrs here in a second. And there's one more attachment that you can get, which is the nose cone attachment. And <clears throat> so th th what's important about this is just for a few hundred dollars, you now have a surgical, surgical handpiece. You don't have to buy a hall drill like they have at the university, nitrogen driven drill or something like that. You don't have to do that. All you have to do is buy this one attachment and it snaps down right on top of your e-motor e e just like this one does and it turns it into a surgical solution. So this is a very cost effective way to, to get through that. You can also get one of these which is your, your nose cone attachment. It's also an E-type drive, an electric drive. It has external irrigation. It doesn't have any air coming out the tip. And so this works really well if you have a motor that's uh, capable of driving a um, stronger motor. This one works well with the longer, the longer drills, the longer shanks, and you can use them with the, the rounds or the straights. So these work really well for getting in the posterior. Say for instance, you're working back here. This can keep your hand out. You can get a finger rest out here and you can get back in there and you can cut back in here very nicely. So that's very nice as well. So those are your two, uh, two hand piece options. When we talk about burrs, I've circled the one in the middle here. It's the 702 Crosscut Tapered Fisher Burr is my workhorse. So on the left, you'll see that there's a 701, a 702, a 703. The 701 is the small one, the 702 is in the middle, the 703 is on the right, and they get a little bit uh, wider in diameter. <clears throat> the 702 seems to be the perfect size for almost everything that I do. If I need the trough to be a little bit wider, I'll just make a couple passes with the 702 and it'll make it wider. But there's one more thing about the 702 that's really clever, and that's this right here. So this is how you would section an upper first molar you would section it, we call it the peace sign. You can see the 1970s peace sign in that image right there. So what we've done is we separated the mesial buccal cusp, our mesial buccal root, the distal buccal root, and the palatal root into three separate roots, and now we can elevate those out. This is where I use my 301 straight elevator. So after I make this, this cut, what I want to do is I want to go and I want to use the three separate roots to apply allow me to apply forces to each other 
internally. So I'm going to go down into those three little grooves that I've created and I'm going to take my 301 and rotate it lightly. Now here's the thing. <clears throat> On one of the very first slides I said when you're using your 702, you typically don't go deep enough and this is why. Look down in there. What do you see? You don't see anything, right? You see dark red darkness. You can't see how far you've cut. Well, what's underneath that suit? The sinus. So when we're cutting through the crown, like in this case, the crown is say seven to eight millimeters tall and you've cut seven to eight millimeters tall with this drill, this fissure burr, and you start to, you start to get nervous. You're thinking, how much further do I have to cut? So a lot of times what people will do is they will under prepare this tooth. They won't cut deep enough with a 702. They'll take their, they'll take their straight elevator and they'll put it into one of those grooves and when they rotate it, all that happens is the cusp breaks off and now the root, uh, the root is in the hole <clears throat> and you've got to uh, subsequently lengthen your, 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 uh, your, um, the groove that you've cut in the tooth. You've got to take it deeper. Okay, so here's a little tip. Notice here on these illustrations, I want, I want you to take this one thing home. If you look from the free gingival margin, the very far tooth on the left, you look at the line where it shows the free gingival margin, and then you look on the t and, and you look to the furcation location, notice it says three millimeters. And if you look to the rest of the images, it's either between three and four millimeters from the free gingival margin to the furcation, it's three to four millimeters. Now I've put into this illustration in the center of the picture, a 702 burr, which happens to be 4.1 millimeters long. Okay, so how does it work? When you're making that peace sign cut, when you're, when you're cutting an upper first molar into three roots, you're going to make sure that you use the, the, uh, the fissures on the burr as your ruler. When those fissures are at the top of the free, uh, the, at, coincidental with the free gingival margin, you know that the tip is now four millimeters down, it should be cutting through the frication. That's how you know how deep you're going to go. And notice this, if you look at this, you're still on the picture on the left from the frication to the tip, 13 millimeters. So 13 minus four is nine. You're still nine millimeters away from potentially the floor of the sinus if it's not pneumatized. So you're a long ways away. So this, if you keep this in mind, it's going to give you a lot more confidence when cutting these molars into three separate teeth. What happens now is when you cut it and you actually get down into the, the radicular bone by a half a millimeter or so, when you, when you put your 301 in there and you elevate, the whole root tip will come out as one piece. It'll come out as one piece if you do it that way. So it's a very clever way of doing it. It's the same thing for your lowers as well. You're going to use that free gingival margin on the lowers as well to do the exact same thing, except you're not going to cut a peace sign on your lower first molars. You're just going to cut it from buccal to lingual right in the center of the tooth, cutting the, the, the mesial roots away from the distal roots. Okay. When you're cutting these teeth, uh, always stop short of the lingual on the lower. Okay. You don't want to go straight through the tooth on the lingual and then through the bone on the lingual and then potentially nick the lingual nerve, okay? So on the lingual, you're going to make your cut and then you're going to have your assistant rinse and then you're going to visualize the remaining tooth structure and you're going to leave just a hair, just a hair on the lingual. And then what you do is you go in, you can go ahead and cut the buckle if you need to, cut straight through the buckle, leave that buckle bone cut straight through the buckle, but then when you put your 301 down in there and you rotate it, the, t the tooth is going to pop. And I like to warn the patient, I say, Mr. Smith, when I rotate this instrument, you're going to hear a little pop. I fully expect to hear that, okay? And then you hear this little pop, that's the tooth fracturing the rest of the way down. And at that point, you should have a cleared enough space for you to elevate these both of these mesial roots and distal roots into that space you've created with that 702 burr. Occasionally, we need to be a little bit more fine-tuned, which is why we use this burr right here, the 859 by Brassler. It's a very, very fine-tipped diamond burr, and this, is, this can be used for a, a multitude of things. But if you have a root tip, uh, let's say you want to do an atraumatic extraction in the anterior and, you, and um, there is a root tip, not by your cause, because if you were doing it following our protocol, 
that root tip would be loose. But let's say the patient came in with trauma and they fracture the tooth and the root tip is, a, is a two thirds of the way down the socket. And there's a little tip in there and you can't seem to get any purchase point on it. This is where this medium a needle diamond comes in really handy. And you can go ahead and do it in um, uh, a hemisection of the remaining root tip, preferably from the facial to the lingual, being very conscious of the buccal bone. And then when you elevate those two pieces together, you won't be applying any forces to the buccal bone. It's called the cat eye technique because when you look down on the hole, the slit you made in the tooth and the remaining root remnant will look like a cat eye. Always have an eight round. You never know when you need to roughen up the surface of the tooth, of the socket. And then this is the cube. So when we're doing surgical extractions, I always have this cube in my in, in, handy in my operatory, and it is a piezo. It is the simplest, most powerful piezo I've ever used. It has two things on it. Water, so you turn up or down the water, and then you turn up and down the power. That's it. They made it really simple for us, guys. Really simple. What's a piezo? A piezo is a device that changes electrical energy into mechanical energy. And I will show you here on my, I will come zoom in here. You'll see here, this is my handle for my cube. And it's connected to the cord back to the cube. It's called a cube because the box is a cube. Pretty, pretty self-explanatory. But these tips, there's a variety of different tips that you can get to do different things. So if you're doing sinuses or ridge augmentations, uh, ridge splits, <coughs> excuse me, um, it works really well. And the way this works is if you're going to go into extraction site, let me see if I can find a good model here. This one's pretty good. This little blade here is going to vibrate. And when it vibrates, it's going to create space. So you can go down, if there was a root remnant in here, you can go down on the, on the mesial. And what I like to do is I like to do this rocking motion with this and seat it on the distal, a rocking motion, and on the pallet, a rocking motion. But I never go down on the buckle. Why? Because the buckle is really thin. That bone is typically one millimeter or thinner. And it's just not enough there for us to take this piezo into that location. So this vibrating piezo tome will go down to length and will create space. And once we create space, we can remove the remnants. Let's go to a video and show you how it works. So we have a lateral here that's broken off, as you can see from the radiograph. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to elevate the, the soft tissue with our MALT-9 very gingerly. We're going to leave the papilla in place at this point because we want, this is an anterior, we want to keep that. And I get on it with, with rotational forces, but it's too, it's too demineralized, it's mushy, it falls apart. So I immediately go to my cube, I go on the distal with that rocking motion with an apical pressure, and then on the lingual. And then once I've created a little bit of space, I can take my, my straight elevator into that space and elevate a little bit, go back to my straight forceps, creating rotation forces, and it, came out, and it comes out. Now look at the root tip. You see the little hook on the root tip? That's what was holding us up. And if I didn't have that piezo, it would have been a little bit more challenging to get it out. Decorticate the socket with your, your um, serrated curette and make sure you get a good bleeding and you're, you're good to go there. There's a, if you've done a flap and you need to do a suturing, and we, we cover sutures in a different course, but if you're going to do it, the Casto Viejos are my favorite needle drivers. You know, traditionally in this image here, you can see I've got a traditional set in the lower left corner, and then the castos are on the right. And so let me show you here uh, the difference. All right, Siri, could you zoom out a little bit? Thank you. So here's your traditional needle drivers that most folks uh, were trained on, and here are the castros. And here's why I like these. You put the needle in here, it has a locking device, so you can lock it, and now the needle's locked in position, and I can hold it like a pencil. We're all very comfortable and very used to holding things like a pencil. And I can go into an odd spot in which just a rotation of my finger, I can create the purchase and get the bite that I need with my suture with this. When using this instrument, I go into the site and the motion is an entire arm motion. Now some people may like that. You might like that because by moving a larger mass like this, you might get a little less tremor. You might be a little bit more stable. But personally, I find that working with 
the 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 dexterity with the finger movement with a rotation like this works really well for me. So this is what we use. We have this in all our perio kits. Uh, the Castaviejos like it a lot. The Dean scissors, they're kind of an offset scissors for cutting your sutures. They look like this. We keep these in the kit as well. And that's pretty much, oh, we've got just a couple more things to talk about and that's pretty much gonna be it for our kit. We, we always keep a pair of these straight scissors in our kit as well. The Isis scissors, they're very small and very delicate and they work great for cutting little things that need to be cut, but they also work great for cutting your collagen. So if you're doing an, an ice cream cone, like Tarnow's ice cream cone technique for uh, grafting, and you need to really trim the cross-linked collagen membrane, this works really well for that. So these work great for that. We keep those in the, in the kit. And the last thing I want to show you is the, I think, whoops, I went one too far, is this right here, which is our oral surgery cassette. And we love to keep all of our instruments in these cassettes. They're color-coded and they are um, labeled for the procedures that need to be done. So a standard extraction kit uh, will have the instruments that we covered today. And then if we were doing any sort of soft tissue work or uh, like perio work, we'd have another small kit that would augment this. Or if we were doing uh, sutures, or that we were doing a lot of suturing, we'd have another set that would have an augmented set. So we keep them in these cassettes and I like these a lot. All of this will be available to you at the end when you fill out the um, survey, which is the last thing you need to do in order to get your, your CE. You're going to fill out the survey, and that survey is going to also come with a, a PDF that will have all of these products labeled and numbered for you so that you guys can go through and pick out the ones that you like if you, if you need to get those. So fill out the survey. Please be honest, send us back your honest feedback. It's a link. It's a link. Yep, they're going to get a link in their email. And then you click on the link and it'll take you to the survey and you'll also get the, um, the um, PDF from Hugh Freedy. Guys, I'm sorry about all of the glitches that we had today, but uh, I want to say thank you for staying with us. If you're watching this in real time, then Fill out that survey now, you'll automatically get your CE. If you're watching this video after the dates today is the 6th, if you're watching this after the 6th, in order to get your CE, simply just get in touch with Catherine at Stanley Institute and she'll take care of that for you. So just send us an email. Here is the list of all of the opportunities for you guys to follow us and uh, stay in touch with us. <clears throat> you can reach us on any one of these handles. Uh, reach out to us anytime if we can be of any assistance to you. Was there anything else? Just contact us on the website. Yep, yep. You can contact us through our website. Just go to stanleyinstitute.com. And, and there's, there's a contact us button. And you can click on that and, and go straight to us. So let's, so let's go to the questions. questions. What questions do we have? Do you ever use periotomes for atraumatic extractions? Yes, the question is, uh, do I ever use peritomes for atraumatic extractions? And the, and the answer is yes. But typically I use them connected to my piezo cube uh, by Acteon. That thing will take my piezotome and vibrate and creates that space. It slides right down in the periodontal space like a hot knife through butter. It gets me down in no time flat. And then I go right back to my normal protocol, which is rotating those, those uh, conical shaped teeth and rotating them out. So the answer is yes. Do you have a special technique to remove canines since they have longer roots? The question is, do I have a special technique for removing canines since they have more surface area and they have longer roots? <clears throat> I mentioned it earlier, uh, kind of, but not really. I'm still going to rotate those teeth out just like all the other teeth, but because they have a longer, a longer uh, shank, I mean a longer tooth, and they have more surface area, oftentimes what I'll do is I'll, I'll get on them with my ash forceps which creates that mechanical advantage, and I'll go to rotate them. And if I feel like I'm pushing too hard and then I'm, I might risk the, the separating the crown from the root, I'll stop and I'll wait. Uh, I'll make up an excuse if I'm going to stay in the room. If I'm going to leave the room to go do something else, I'll say, 
Mr. Smith, we need to get a special instrument. I'll be back in just a minute, and we'll just let the, let the tooth wait three to four minutes and come back, and then get right back on it with the ash forceps, and almost every time, it comes right out. It's probably been 10 years since I've dug for a root tip on a canine. They, if you follow this protocol, it'll come out every time. Do you lay the patient all the way back when you use the ash forcep for maxillary teeth? I keep the patient uh, probably about 30 degrees from horizontal, so the chair is probably about 30 degrees for maxillary teeth. And then for mandibular teeth, they might be closer to a 45 degree angle. So no, not all the way back. Uh, I don't have any issues with vis uh, vision or access with the ash forcep in the top or the bottom arch. Thoughts on the physics forcep? Physics forceps. Uh, the, the Golden Mish physics forceps, they've changed names uh, a number of times. I like them a lot. They work under the principles that we've talked about today in terms of applying a constant force and then allowing that tooth to go through creep where it's going to start to move, the bone is going to start to give and the tooth is going to start to move and then the tooth just falls out about three to four minutes afterwards. So they work really well. They work great. I just haven't, I've, I've played with them. We've had them, we bought them about 10 years ago. We play with them, but I have such good luck, luck with the three instruments that I use, the Ash Forcep, the 88s and the 23s, that I just, I just, a creature of habit, I just haven't changed. Explain the difference between a double action and a single action rongeur. The double action, a uh, single action rongeur looks just it has one pivot point. So if you look at this needle driver here, it has one axis, one pivot point right here, right? So a single action run drawer would look just like this, except instead of having the needle drivers out here, it would have the sharp, sharp, sharp beaks for pinching bone, okay? A double action run drawer actually has a pivot point here and another one back here, and they're connected with a hinge action. And so what ends up happening is you get a mechanical advantage by using a double action run drawer. If, if in our course, when we do the course, we go through all of that, we have comparisons between the two and you get to use all of these instruments. But right now, we've condensed it, so we left off the rangeurs. But <clears throat> if you ever come to the class, or if you go to the Hugh Freedy website, you can see a double action rangeur versus a single action rangeur on their website. Do you use cow horns for curved roots as well? I use cow horns for, for all of them. If, when I get on a curved, the question was, do I use cow horns for curved roots? The answer is yes, and here's my protocol. Let's say I get on a, uh, a, a first lower molar where the roots are curved in towards each other, so they're kind of pinched around the radicular bone. I'll go ahead and get on it with the 23s, and I start doing my pumping action, and I usually start to see some form of motion, okay? So I know the roots are, are curved towards each other, and I know they're not wanting to come out with the cow horns but I'm getting the motion that I want. So now I know the entire tooth is loose. The, the mesial root and the distal root are loose. I might go so far as to apply even more force to the forceps, squeeze hard enough so that the cow horns separate the tooth. It literally snaps the tooth in half. I warn the patient if they're not sedated ahead of time that they may hear a snap. But what happens is, is that it just created a crack right from the buckle to the lingual between the mesial root and the distal root. And a lot of times, once they're cracked, at that point, you can go in with a straight elevator and just take the front root out, take the back root out. So I go ahead and use the cow horns as my separating device to actually snap the tooth in half. But I don't do that. Remember, so important, I've said it a, numer a number of times, I never do that to start with. I would never go with that strategy to start with. I wanna loosen the tooth first and then do that. Do you, do you ever have to lay, the flip, lay a flap for difficult extractions? Question is, do I ever have to lay a flap for difficult extractions? Once in a while, the first thing I'll do is I'll do what you've seen in most of these videos where we just elevate the tissue gently and we get that forcep down. But once in a while, the remaining tooth structure that is above the bone is so mushy, so soft that you can't get on it. You have, no, you have no option at that point then to go to a surgical pr uh, protocol. And at that point, you do have to have vision. You, you, you can't do these things blind. So at that point, I would do, I would do a, a number of different types of flaps, envelope flaps, distal releasing book, bookmark flaps, distal releasing flaps, trapezoidal flaps, pap papillary spilling, sparing flaps, a variety of different flaps, depending on which tooth I'm working on and the location in the mouth. 
When would you elevate a tooth prior to going to a forceup? Almost never. Uh, the que- oh, sorry, I keep forgetting to ask the question. Ask, uh, ask the question. The question was, when would I elevate a tooth with with a straight elevator prior to going to a forcep? And it's, the, the the answer is never on anterior teeth because they're all straight. That would be like taking a carrot that's in the ground and and then pushing the carrot this way with hope that you're not going to just snap the top of the carrot off. It, it, the, the top of the carrot's just going to snap off. That I would never do that. What I would do is I'd get down around that carrot as deep as I can around the dirt, around the neck of it, and I would just rotate it a couple times and pluck it out. So anterior teeth, never. Every once in a while, if you have a tooth in the posterior and you're doing a, a serial extraction where you're taking out the whole arch and you just want to loosen them, the, the straight elevators work really well there because if I knock off an adjacent restoration, I don't have to worry about putting it back on. I'm taking all the teeth out. So I will use them for that case because they're good at what they do. They do create leverage and they create space and they create motion with the tooth and the bone. The situation is, is that a lot of times they create uh, motion on both teeth, the tooth you're taking out and the tooth beside it. And that's the problem. So if you get that motion where, they're, where, the, where it's pushing on the tooth you don't want to push on, that can become a problem, right? So that's why I don't use them. And then the last comment is about our implant compare channel. Jeff Durback from Action mentioned it. So if you want to chat about our live surgical. Yeah. So we are on implant compare which is a live streaming service that you guys can j- jump in on. And occasionally what we'll do is we'll actually stream a live video, a live surgery. So it's from beginning to end and uncut and live, uh, hopefully a little bit better than today's <laughs> than today's uh, ex- excapades that we had. I apologize for the three little glitches we had today. But the, a live video from beginning to end, and it's free. So it's for doctors to get on and, uh, and get some good CE, and, and uh, we really like that, that platform. So check out Implant Compare, and uh, you can get some good stuff there. All right, if there aren't any other questions, guys, we're gonna go ahead and wrap it up. Remember, when you get the survey, go ahead and fill out the survey, and then you can um, get the, uh, the link to the PDF that will tell you exactly all these instruments if you need. We're really open here at Stanley Institute. If you guys have any questions, feel free to reach out to Dr. Robert at uh, stanleyinstitute.com. That's my email. Um, You can get us on our website at stanleyinstitute.com as well. If there's anything we can do in these troubling times to help you guys get through it, uh, we're here for you. So reach out to us.